We will now continue the sixth day of the budget hearings with testimony from Com Commissioner Lizette Camilo of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. The Finance Committee is joined this morning by my co-chair, Ben Kalos, and the members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I want to acknowledge the members of the committee. We have Lori Cumbo with us, Councilmember Cumbo, um, and other members will be joining us throughout the hearing. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement and turn it over to co-chair, to my co-chair, um, to deliver his opening remarks. I will now turn it over to Chair Kalos, um, who then will, will swear you in, Commissioner, right after our council will swear you in, and then you may begin. Good afternoon and welcome to this hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations for the Fiscal Year 2018 Executive Budget held jointly with the Committee on Finance. I'd like to thank our co-chair, Julissa Ferris Copeland of the Finance Committee for her leadership and uh, day six. I'm uh, Ben Kalos, I'm chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. As always, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos. I encourage anyone watching who cares about how the city is spending $84.9 billion to tweet me with questions for agencies and I'll do my best to ask them. During today's fiscal year 2018 executive budget proceeding, we'll be hearing from the Law Department, the Board of Elections, the Campaign Finance Board, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS. These agencies manage a variety of essential administrative services, such as defending the city from lawsuits, administering our civil service exams, managing city vehicle fleet and buildings, running our elections, and managing our city's campaign finance system. As always, governmental operations is focused on ensuring that the city is running as effectively and cost efficiently as possible while still providing our citizens with the highest quality services. With this goal in mind, we will be discussing such issues as the reduction of the city's legal bills, the optimal use of city's properties and ensuring that voters have access to poll site, poll worker language interpreters and accessibility ramps at voting sites. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Zach, who is our uh, <coughs> Zach Harris, who is our new committee uh, finance analyst, as well as uh, Brad Reed, our committee counsel, and John Russell, our unit head. And also, uh, we will acknowledge council members as they join us from the committee. And I'd like to remind uh, members that since we have a lot of questions, we're asking for first round Q&A limited to five minutes and three minutes in the second round for any subsequent round if we have after that. Uh, I'll now ask uh, that we swear our uh, witnesses in if we have, we have a committee counsel. Great. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Good afternoon, Chair Ferreras Copeland, Ta Chair Kalos, and committee members. I am Lisette Camilo, Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. And I'm joined by members of my executive team to discuss the planned expenditures and revenues for FY18, as well as highlights of the DCAS capital plan. The mayor's FY18 executive budget supports our agency's goal of being an accessible, accountable support agency, delivering essential services and expertise for city agencies, city employees, and the public. Each day, we provide resources that enable our clients to further the administration's vision for a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable city. This budget builds on our agency's accomplishments over the last year and will support our major priorities this year, including more efficient administration of civil service tests, the deployment of a space management initiative, increased MWBE utilization, and further reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in city-owned buildings. This budget also enables DCAS to continue the acceleration of the city's clean fleet initiative and funds important safety fleet initiatives as part of Vision Zero. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide updates for some of the projects highlighted in my preliminary FY18 budget testimony, as well as talk about some of our new initiatives. DCAS continues to work on compliance with the New York State Civil Service Law to reduce provisional employees. Key to these efforts is the administration of civil service examinations in a more efficient manner. To that end, we developed a new type of civil service exam called the Qualified Incumbent Examination, which is given to provisional staff who have served at least two years in one of 193 titles specified in the New York State legislation that granted the city a two-year extension for provisional reduction. DCAS began administering QIEs in late January 2017 and anticipates administering 67 QIEs by the end of FY17 with 115 QIEs slated for FY18. 
In addition to the QIEs, DCAS is projecting to administer conventional civil service examinations for another 75 titles in FY18 to ensure that we are providing city agencies with pools of qualified candidates to fill critical city positions. DCAS continues to lead the way in providing training on diversity and inclusion and equal employment opportunity rights to city employees. For FY17 to date, we have provided classroom and computer-based training to over 16,000 employees and we're on track to meet our FY17 training goal of approximately 20,000 employees. In the remaining months of this fiscal year, we are focused on deploying online transgender inclusion training. For FY18, DCAS plans to train an additional 20,000 employees. DCAS continues to work on maximizing MWBE vendor participation by conducting outreach and ensuring that MWBEs are included as a normal part of the agency's purchasing culture. In fact, this fiscal year, we have hosted more than 15 events, and we plan to continue this work in the upcoming year. These events are an important way to communicate with businesses and are part of the reason why DCAS continues to see growth in the number of contracts we are awarding to MWBE firms. In this fiscal year, we have awarded approximately $20 million in contracts to MWBE firms and are on pace to exceed the dollars we awarded in FY16. DCAS is working to make the largest municipal fleet the safest and most sustainable. Our fleet team is leading the implementation of the NYC Clean Fleet Initiative to add 2,000 electric vehicles to the city's fleet by 2025 and to reduce transportation greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. We are happy to report that we are ahead of schedule and we will reach 1,000, over 1,000 on-road electric vehicles by the end of the summer. We expect to reach at least 1,250 EVs by the end of fiscal year 18. DCAS is working with the first deputy mayor and the OMB director to implement a new citywide office space management initiative. The goal is to maximize the use of all city-owned and private leased space currently occupied by city agencies. Any new request for additional space will be evaluated to determine if there are opportunities to maximize that agency's existing space or utilize the city's own portfolio before entering into any new leases. The maximization of the use of space is also expected to reduce the citywide cost for leasing space by $3 million, which is incorporated into DCAS's FY18 budget, along with an additional citywide reduction of $10 million in FY19. DCAS is ramping up the rate of installation of clean energy technologies within the city. DCAS estimates that it will initiate 17 megawatts of solar power clean distributed generation projects this calendar year, which is almost double what we have installed to date. DCAS is also piloting energy storage technologies that are both standalone and coupled with clean distributed generation. DCAS expects to have the first two energy storage demonstration projects completed this calendar year. These pilot programs will increase the efficiency of distributed generation reduce peak demands and corollary energy costs, and enhance emergency power provisions. DCAS's expense budget reflects funding of $1.2 billion and a budgeted headcount of 2,419 in fiscal 18. The majority of DCAS's planned FY18 expenditure, $714 million, is allocated for the citywide heat, light, and power expenses. The FY18 energy budget is a collaborative effort between DCAS and OMB in forecasting agency energy usage as well as commodity rates in the upcoming fiscal year. DCAS continues to work closely with agencies citywide to enhance the energy performance of their facilities through a range of programs, which includes retrofitting equipment and improving operations and maintenance. In the FY18 executive budget, DCAS received expense funding to enhance our services through joint efforts, efforts with other city agencies, including but not limited to public safety, office space efficiencies, improvement in the citywide procurement processes, and the administration of the non-public non school security program. Some highlights include office space management initiative, DCAS received funding for 21 positions and $2.9 million to more closely and effectively manage space utilization by agencies. DCAS received seven engineering and architectural positions and $800,000 to perform the work to relocate the Brooklyn Housing Court from privately leased space at 141 Livingston Street to a city-owned building at 210 Jerusalem Street. DCAS, in coordination with the Mayor's Office of Contracts and FISA, is working on the Citywide Procurement Innova Innovation Initiative. 
One of the keys to this initiative is the creation of new technology to simplify and add transparency to citywide procurement. The implementation of Passport will allow us to decommission several DCAS and citywide procurement systems, such as the CLIPS mainframe that is used to create citywide contracts and Vendex. DCAS IT received three positions and $400,000 for staff to work on the development of the new system, Passport, which will be used to manage the annual $15 billion citywide procurement process. DCAS received a total of $19.8 million in FY18 as required by Local Law 2 to be used to reimburse security expenses incurred by participating non-public schools. Now, as requested by OMB, we have identified savings in the areas that will not adversely affect the agency's ability to provide critical services to both the public and our client city agencies. Some of these include NYSERDA incentive payments. In FY18, DCAS expects to receive an additional 400,000 in incentive payments from the New York State Energy Research Development Authority associated with the installation of solar photovoltaic power projects at 24 schools, which were completed in FY16. The elimination of vacant positions. DCAS will eliminate 10 vacant positions in FY18, which will result in $700,000 in savings. The agency will implement this reduction in areas that will create the least adverse impact to agency operations. And civil service exams revenue. DCAS is projecting to earn an additional $1.5 million in civil service exam fees in FY18 as a result of an increased number in the increased number of exams associated with the provisional reduction program. Revenues. The FY18 total DCAS revenue budget is $65.8 million, primarily due to commercial rents of city-owned property projected at $43.1 million, the sale of surplus vehicles and other city-owned equipment totaling $8.9 million, and anticipated revenue of approximately $5.3 million in filing fees for civil service examinations. As you're aware, the executive budget reflects an updated 10-year capital plan of $4.8 billion for fiscal years 18 through 27 to maintain and enhance DCAS facilities and build out leased office spaces. More specifically, the executive capital budget for 18 is $880 million and will allow us to complete some of the following initiatives. Within DCAS managed facilities, DCAS capital construction program for city-owned office space and court buildings total $428 million, including $83 million allocated for electrical upgrades at Queens Criminal Court, 210 Joalaman Street, and the Brooklyn Appellate Court. DCAS received $9.3 million in funding to replace the existing property management database with a new integrated space management system to better track and manage our space portfolio. The capital plan for FY18 totals $315 million, including $27.4 million for the solar power additions, lighting fixtures, and energy efficiency retrofits at DOE schools. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss DCAS's planned expenditures and revenues for FY18, as well as our capital plan. I look forward to a continued working relationship with the council over the next year, and I welcome any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Commissioner. The executive plan um, adds 21 new positions or new staff at an annual cost of $2.2 million to manage the citywide space management program, which is expected to save the city tens of millions of dollars. How are we saving money through the citywide space management program? Um, and are we going to reevaluate our leases as an example? Or if you can just clearly state for the record, What's the process for the savings? Sure. Every new request for additional space uh, is being reviewed pursuant to the direction of the First Deputy Mayor and the Budget Director. Uh, what we're trying to do is really reassess agencies' current usage of their space to maximize that space in order to address any need rather than going out and finding additional leased space um, in order to reduce our dependency on privately leased space. So we, the goal is to avoid entering into leases wherever possible uh, and accommodating new needs with city-owned property or current lease space that can be reconfigured to address their need and, and, and not have to go out and get a new lease. But in some cases, that's the only option that you have. Sure. And some spaces are either um, in conditions that it's not even worth repairing, 
or you know re retrofitting um, can can you walk us through the possibility because you know we also understand that there's going to be facilities that you're going to have to leave that may be city owned what is your relationship let's say with the school construction authority right because that's one of the biggest challenges that we have is actually finding space so if we have a facility that you're moving out of is there communication between other agencies or, in, our, in this case, the School Construction Authority, because both the chair and I are constantly trying to find space, and this might not be something that's even public information because it's still kind of on your desk that you're looking for space for, for someone to leave a city-owned space. So what is that like? And also, I guess, I wanted to more clearly understand why 21 staff members, why not 15, or why not 30? why this number, what will they be doing um, to exactly deliver on this $2.1 million, this $2.2 million cost to potentially give these millions of dollars of savings? The, you, you hit a number of, of, of right. issues. So the team itself, it, we needed the resources to literally go out and evaluate current utilization of space to determine whether or not we can reconfigure existing space to address any potential additional needs to reconfigure to include more um, more workstations rather than l exiting one space and and leasing out another space. So the 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 number of activities that. Uh, we will be engaging in, we are currently not resourced to do. We don't have the staff to go out there and, and, and document and track current space utilization across the city agencies. Um, with regard to um, other agencies and what their footprint is uh, on their lease space, the SA is a little bit different. They ha they're an authority that, um, whose mission is to, to build schools. Um, we are really talking about office space. So we're, you know, we will certainly reach out to see if there's any possibility for um, collaboration and accommodation of office space. But currently, um, the, the, the approach would be to do a, have a, a much more comprehensive program of keeping track of all of the current used uh, city space, leased out space, um, and, and see how they're currently being utilized in order to, to make better informed decisions on, on how to accommodate new requests. So these 21 positions are, what is, what is the expertise that you need sure. to do this job that you're asking them to do? So we have a number of architects uh, that we're bringing on to help with assessments, um, client space managers uh, to be able to to have a, a holistic view of the of the request and and get a better understanding of uh, not only the current need but also the entire footprint of an agency because some agencies have uh, locations all across the city and they might need accommodation in for one unit um, but I think having someone with a comprehensive understanding of the program and the entire the entire agency's footprint, office footprint, um, it would be helpful uh, to have dedicated resources to do that. Uh, we do have, uh, we have to replace our, our very old IT uh, systems in order to support um, much more upgraded and modern um, systems, so we, we need a, a, a director for, for that. Um, we have uh, real property managers, architects, we have an AutoCAD technician. Um, an electrical and a mechanical engineer because we're going to need people to go out there and evaluate the structures and the, um, and, and the mechanics of, of the spaces in order to recommend changes. Um, so it is a, a, a program developed soup to nuts um, f from evaluating to reconfiguring to um, looking at the space physically, keeping track of it, and making recommendations across the city uh, footprint. So how will you measure its success, right? Because right now it's hundreds of millions of, or tens of millions, tens of millions of dollars. Um, so how are you measuring the success since it seems like it's not going to be like they go out for, for the next 60 days, evaluate everything, and they're going to present you a report? Or is that something that they're going to do? So right now, when the first deputy mayor and the budget director issued uh, a memorandum for all agency heads uh, regarding this initiative, uh, there were, DCAS had a number of requests for new leased space. So had we not had that 
um, uh, uh, direction by the first deputy mayor and the budget director, the standard procedure was we would go out and we would look for new space and we would negotiate a lease and then they would and they would move in. Um, right now, we are reevaluating all of those requests to determine whether or not they can we can provide we can address their need with city-owned space or. Uh, we can uh, alleviate or address their needs by l having them stay there or expand in other offices. Um, and if we can't accommodate their need, remember there were um, some programs were added and so headcount has, has increased in, in pockets of agencies. Um, so if we determine that we can't um, accommodate, then we will proceed with the lease, but always with the, the with the goal in mind to minimize the leased out footprint. So there have been a number of requests, for example, uh, for from agencies that have different offices all over the city, a request to consolidate, to break leases so that they can all fit into one contiguous building with different floors. And would it be ideal? Sure. Is it necessary? Probably not. So let's really take a, a much closer look at what those requests are in the consolidation example. If it's not supported by operational need, uh, you, you do the math. Breaking leases and entering into much larger leases to accommodate that desire is far more expensive than just looking for the, a smaller subset of new space to address a growth. Uh, but maintaining your other offices all across the city or, or however you, you may deem it. So, um, you know, in, in, in that, that's a, a very clear example of where we would find a lot of savings because the initial request to consolidate has a much bigger price tag than uh, looking for a much smaller space to address a smaller, very well articulated and documented need. And so that's how we would approach the, the savings. Okay. Um, so this is kind of this is definitely a more permanent unit that yes. we're going to see. Yes. It's not kind of. No. This is the challenge that you have. Resolve it, and that's it. This is going to be the new way DCAS does business. Absolutely. Unfortunately, there's been a, a move away from looking at our own assets, our city-owned assets, and fixing those to accommodate greater headcount or more workstations or et cetera to maximize the citywide footprint. Um, I think in the past that the, the thought was, let's just go out to the private market and see what we can do. Uh, so part of the exercise is actually doing walkthroughs of our city, or the decast managed space for offices and, and looking at where we can find some, some spaces that have been perhaps historically underutilized, that we can do renovations and investing in our own buildings. And actually, the, in, in this budget, there have been um, capital funds allotted to the upgrades of a couple of floors within city-owned buildings with, with that eye to uh, upgrade some spaces, to prepare them for um, either, you know, increased uh, uh, usage for particular agencies or even using them as swing space in order to, you know, move one agency out of their space while we fix that and then have them move over, um, but always with the eye to minimizing or reducing our reliance on the private market. Okay. I um, mean, the executive plan funding for citywide heat, light, and power is reduced by $20.2 million in the current fiscal year, bringing down the total projected uh, utilities cost of $686.5 million for fiscal 2017. However, the plan adds $7.1 million to fiscal 2018 for utilities expenses, bringing its total to $713.9 million. Can you give us a general sense of how much of the reduction in 2017's results from energy efficiency efforts and how much is a, res is a, a result of just lower energy costs and which agencies have recognized the largest savings um, and also what caused the increase in heat, light and power funding for 2018? Because if we're gonna go by 2017's numbers, you think why aren't we finding the same savings for FY18? So I'm going to kick it off, but I'm going to turn it over to uh, the Deputy Commissioner for uh, Energy Management, Anthony Fiore. Um, the, the budget for FY17 has been reconciled to more closely reflect the actual usage of city agencies. So we had a mild winter uh, and milder summer. So that reflects decreased usage in energy. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I, if I say anything, <laughs> please. 
please correct me. Um, so when we reconcile the actual usage, we see that that trend has been going down, and so we adjusted the budget accordingly. And this is, by the way, an exercise that we do in conjunction with OMB, as I stated in my, in my uh, testimony. When we project out for the upcoming fiscal year, in fiscal year 18, we have to make some assumptions. Um, uh, the first assumption is that we're not going to have as cool uh, a summer or as mild a winter in FY18. So we have to bake into that projection the five-year average going back of, of, of intensity of the weather, because the, the hotter it is, the more AC usage you'll have, et cetera. Um, and in addition, last year, uh, the state announced um, increase in rates uh, for zero emissions credits to subsidize upstate um, nu a nuclear facility. So we have to bake that into the plan as well. Our rates are going to go up. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony to see if I messed anything up. I missed. Do I need to be sweared in? No, we believe you. Okay. It's Thank that you. commissioner we have an issue with now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Commissioner Camillo reported that accurately. Um, 53% of the increase that you see for fiscal year 18 is um, rate related, um, and the majority of that is related to the zero emission credits. 41% is related to weather, um, and then there's a 6% growth factor. So if we were to have a mild winter and another mild summer, this could be an expected savings that we should be able to see in next you know, next executive budget hearings. That, that's correct. Uh, as we go through the year, the, uh, periodically that heat, light, and power budget um, gets adjusted to reflect um, actual end, uh, end of year forecasted um, usage. Okay. Um, so I guess I want to talk more on the capital sense. If we are going in the direction of being more efficient, why are we not seeing those savings because, you know, it's not like the equipment. You, you didn't say that we're savings because, you know, we're being more efficient with our power. It really was the state action and the weather. So we've, it seems like we're investing a lot, and we're going to continue to invest in making our agencies more efficient. So why is that not reflecting so much so in the budget? And I'll kick it off again. There, we do see savings. Okay. Um, it, it, but given some of the other p moving pieces that the city does not control, that, that's why you, you see some of the, the shifting in, in the budget. So essentially, had we not planned for these efficiencies, we would be paying even more. <coughs> that's correct. So um, <laughs> the FY18 budget is about 3.4% lower than the five-year average. So you're actually seeing a, a decrease there, and that's despite about a 25% growth um, if measured by the citywide total budget. Um, so even despite that growth, we're seeing a below, below than average um, uh, heat, light, and power budget. Also between 2008 and 2016, 46, there's been a $46 million net increase in uh, electricity costs. Um, Although the commodity component of electricity has dropped, <coughs> the delivery component has increased, and that's resulted in a $46 million net increase mm -hmm. in costs over that time period. At the same time, the portion of your bill um, that relates to the commodity has dropped from 70% to less than half, and the portion that's represented by delivery has increased from a third to over a half. So th that's a big change in, in not only the rates, but then how the rates um, are proportioned on, on your bill. Um, also, I think, um, you know, that, that's talking about the dollars. And if we look at actual consumption, uh, as the commissioner mentioned, we do see a change. So baked into the FY18 heat, light, and power budget is a $5 million reduction uh, due to energy efficiency projects that we're forecasting. Um, so, so both on the, on the dollar side and on the consumption side, we see decreases. We see about a 6.2% decrease of um, uh, dema uh, build demand uh, as well. So there, there are a number of examples that actually illustrate uh, reductions. So in the 
greenhouse gas reduction plan, where are we with that? Where, you know? Yeah. Uh, so this municipal government has reduced its emissions by 17% since we began tracking in um, uh, fiscal year 06. Uh, so we're about halfway to our interim goal of uh, 35 by 25, 35% reduction by year 2025, um, with the ultimate goal of an 80% reduction by, by 2050. The 35% by 25 goal is buildings specific, and that 17% reduction is, is building specific. The 80 by 50 is all sector reduction, including um, solid waste, transportation, and so forth. So are there any challenges that you saw going through this process? You know. <laughs> yes, there's, there's lots of challenges. Um, you know, as, as one might expect, uh, the, the reductions that we see in emissions so far have um, largely been the result of fuel changing for electric production. So there's been a move from coal as a source of energy to produce electricity to natural gas, and the carbon intensity difference between the two is great, and, that, and that's resulted in the majority of those green and ga greenhouse gas reductions thus far. Um, and you won't see that repeated, right? So, right. so now on, on the central generation side, we need to move from natural gas to renewable energy. And um, you know, with the, with the prices of natural gas today, that makes that challenging going, going forward. Um, also on, on the project side, you know, we've hit the low hanging fruit to begin with, right? And, and so <laughs> as we make these investments and we, we measure the performance of our investments, um, that's gonna get more and more difficult as, as we go forward to get at deeper retrofit. So moving from replacing you know, incandescent lights with LED lights, low hanging fruit, good for your dollar per ton avoided metric, uh, but then as you move into building envelopes, uh, that gets very expensive. And we've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal, Majority Leader Van Bramer, Council Member Minority Leader Matteo, and Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Co-Chair Ferreris Copeland. Uh, so uh, thank you for appearing before us. Uh, the uh, familiar reprise uh, and, and our course uh, is deed restrictions. Uh, so what is the status of deed modification requests since the preliminary budget? Have any been added, any removed? or any progressed? So we have not received any additional uh, inquiries regarding specific projects or specific requests. Two uh, of, the, uh, of the projects or the requests have gotten to the point where the applicants have submitted all of the information required to kick off formally the, the requirements of the of local law. Um, of the and, local and law that was passed, Local Law 176. Uh, so two projects have advanced to formal review. What are the two projects? Uh, one is uh, at Rutland Avenue for the Faith Gospel Assembly Baptist Church, and another one is uh, in Bedford Avenue in Brooklyn uh, by someone named Alfred Oyewole. Do you mind reiterating and or spelling out the, the name? Not at all. Alfred Oyewole, O-W-O-Y-E-W-O-L-E. -E. And what are the restrictions that are being lifted? So for the church, their current uh, restriction uh, is limited to, or the property is limited to community facility uses. So they operate a church, which is consistent with the deed modification, they they, the deed restriction. They requested a modification to allow uh, affordable housing. So that is what they have planned. Okay, so they want to do community facility and affordable housing. So, right. and for that affordable housing, would there be further restrictions on the definition of affordability? At this point, we are undertaking uh, the due diligence review. We haven't gotten to that part yet, um, and you know we're sure when we when we consult and work with our partners at HPD, uh, we will you know get to the bottom of that. And uh, which council members' district is that in? Oh, Councilmember Mealy. 
Okay. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Cornegy and the property at Rutland Avenue. Councilmember Cumbo. Okay. And uh, what deed restrictions are being re uh, lifted at Rutland Avenue? That one was an accessory use only uh, restriction. Uh, so it was an accessory use only. And, and so they're trying to lift that restriction? Completely, right. And so what is the primary use for the adjoining lot? I'm not sure about the adjoining lot. Okay. I don't have that information in front of me. Is there somebody amongst the large number of folks from DCAS who is sitting here who is responsible for deed restrictions who can answer that question? No. We can get back to you on the details. Okay. Uh, to the extent feasible, when you, you appear with 20 or so folks, if that you can make sure to bring that deed restriction, per who is responsible for deed restrictions currently at DCAS? The Acting Deputy Commissioner for Real Estate Services, Laura Ringelheim. Okay. Falls within that. Great. Uh, and I guess, does the fact that it's starting the process mean that uh, DCAS approves this, or at what point does the city decide whether or not it's a, a, a good project to even move forward with? So uh, under the requirements of the new local law, uh, we're at the point where notice was given to the community board, the council member, and the affected borough president. Um, and we then proceed to the due diligence review, gathering all of the information, uh, public hearing, public notice. Um, we present everything to the end, and ultimately DCAS, if you remember, does not make the final determination, but it gets presented to a committee of, of senior uh, officials within the city, and they ultimately make the determination. Okay. Uh, and do you have a copy of the list that you can share with us? No, not with me. Okay, so it's this, but it's It's nothing. the same. It, it was in the other listing that okay. we provided last time. And so I know I have colleagues who are going to ask follow-up questions on that. So, uh, we've, at, so at the preliminary budget hearing on March 13th, I noted you had not publicly posted the position for Deputy Commissioner for Asset Management, and you stated, quote, those should be up. Uh, those went up last week. Uh, we can share those postings with you, end of quote. To date, I haven't received the public posting. This morning, I decided I might like to be a deputy commissioner for asset management and went to search for the job, but still couldn't find it two months later. Has the position of deputy commissioner for asset management been filled? We, have, we had posted the deputy commissioner positions. Uh, they were posted for 30 days. I believe the reason why you didn't find it today or yesterday was because the, those postings had expire, expired. We had received a number of applications. We are starting the interview process. How, um, how many applications? And what were the dates that it was posted for? for? I, I don't have that in front of me, but they expired. At, someone expired at the, I think, mid-April. I think both of them expired in mid-April. We can send you the, the postings. Okay, and so how many people applied? Certainly over 100. And how many internal and how many external candidates applied? We only had a handful of internal candidates. The vast majority were external. And uh, who is currently doing the job of Deputy Commissioner for Asset Management? So we have two interim Deputy Commissioners, uh, one for Facilities uh, Management, Jerry Torres, who is sitting here, um, internal, uh, and uh, the internal interim Deputy Commissioner for Real Estate Services, Laura Ringelheim. Okay. And so you noted 10 vacant positions as part of the citywide savings program. DCAS is eliminating uh, at first savings of 680000 So this is not one of the positions, one of the 10 positions. No. W would you care to provide us with the list of the 10 positions that are being eliminated? We have still not determined which ones. It's a target, and we're working through the specifics. So you're hiring 21 folks, but you're getting rid of 10 folks, uh, which, which comes out to, to a net of 11, and then there's a whole bunch of other positions. But so we're, we, we, we made it from preliminary to executive. You still, we, you don't know the 10 positions you're looking at, or? We are evaluating the operations, and in order to determine which 
positions we will eliminate, we have to see what functions are going to be consolidated and done by certain individuals. So the, it's the vacancies, old vacancies that haven't been filled yet uh, that we are looking at eliminating. But in terms of how we reorganize it, how we reorganize the teams, we need some time to determine what what will pose uh, uh, less of an impact in the operation. So we're, we're in the process of getting that together. So when we will when we will know which ten positions are being eliminated? Is it a July first deadline or it? It was by Felicia, right? Yes, July first. July first. Okay. And uh, just as a follow-up, so in terms of any liabilities or emanating from this, has DCAS or law department received a notice of claim or other communication indicating a pending claim, lawsuit, or investigation relating to the termination of Ricardo Morales? Basically, are we getting sued or investigated for firing him? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, that's my first round, and I'd like to uh, ask if anyone has... Uh, we will hear from Kyle. Oh. Okay. Uh, I will continue on to my uh, second round uh, questions. So just uh, following up on uh, the finance chair's questions on uh, space. Give me one moment to get to that right page. In the budget, you indicate that you're going to save $3 million a year from space management, but you're going to actually end up starting to save $10 million annually from enhanced space management. Uh, tell me what the difference is with the enhanced. By then, we will hopefully have a team ready to uh, really do, like I mentioned before, uh, in-depth analysis of our current uh, footprint, both in the city-owned space and in the lease space, so that uh, we can address some of these requests by um, our, our current footprint rather than going out and, and leasing new space. That's okay. Okay. And uh, along the uh, same lines, so it sounds like you're building a whole new database to deal with the different space requirements, which means you're going to be going building by building, you're going to be putting together CAD drawings, you're going to have engineers, you're going to be evaluating, you're going to be seeing how big offices are, and then you're going to be taking that information and using it to see what can be merged and what spaces can be released and the cost per square foot of every single thing. And that sounds like a tremendously valuable tool. Uh, in building this, will you make sure, and as you take affirmative steps, will you make sure to share that information transparently with the city council, these two committees, as well as the general public, so we can see the return on investment. So we're investing $2 million, and we can actually track and see in a transparent way that we we gave up the lease for this space at this location, and that's how we saved X number of dollars. We can certainly discuss, you know, what information you'd like to see. You know, as we have, we, we've not yet built the system, uh, but we we will happily, you know, work together on the information that you would like to see in, in terms of this project. And and, and to follow up again on uh, my co-chair's question, so. The New York Post on April 11th wrote an article, City Hall mysteriously halts lease deals for government agencies. Uh, so was there, in fact, a hold on leases, and is that hold still in effect? There was never a hold. Uh, the memo that uh, the first deputy mayor and the budget director issued to all agency heads regarding space what was informing them that DCAS would be doing a review of all of the pending new lease requ requests. So that takes some time. Um, so we were in reviewing, we were reviewing all of those requests, but there was no moratorium, there was no uh, pause or hold. We were just going back to the well and uh, making sure that all of the, the requests for new lease space were in fact uh, necessary. Uh, or if we could accommodate them into city-owned buildings, so if that would be the better alternative. Have the leases been signed for the HRA location at 109 East 16th Street, DOI at 180 Lane, Maiden Lane, and NYPD HRA and DSNY at 375 Pearl Street? I don't, I can't speak to the latter, the, the one that I do know that has been signed was the HRA lease at East 16th Street. Uh, and, and so for the other two, they're in progress, they're on hold, they're still in review. Which ones? The for DOI at 180 Maiden Lane. We're still in review. Um, 
again, under the, with the, within the framework of, is there a better way? Um, and it, and it, it look, it's looking like we're, we're having very productive discussions. Um, we have not signed a lease at 180 Maiden Lane for, for that one. We are still currently working out the, that review. Seems like that probably should have been the first lease to get signed given that DOI is an independent body that has been giving DCAS a lot of trouble. So I guess if you can make sure that there is, is there a timeline on the review process? No. So I guess the New York Post is saying this is a hold if, yeah. It, if if uh, the, D, uh, the New York Post is suggesting this is a, a hold, if the review process can be indefinite, uh, what's the difference between a review and a hold? And uh, will, will you agree to uh, limit your review period? We, I think the goals of the exercise, which, by the way, are for every agency that submitted a new lease request, and we're treating every agency's request the same. Um, some requests are, are smaller than others, especially given the amount of square footage that are being uh, requested. Um, and the more, the bigger the ask, the longer the review. Uh, the, the most important goal here is to, you know, make sure that any agreements that the city enters into for lease space matches the actual need. Um, you know, this is not certainly anything that we want to take uh, an indefinite time through. We, we, we have clients. We want to make sure that they get the space that they, that they request. So, um, so will it be done by the next fiscal year? Will it be done by July 1st, The review? Yeah. I, I, I certainly hope so, yes. Uh, and then the New York Post cited a, quote, whopping price, end of quote, of $76.83 sorry, $76 per square foot for the century-old building in the village while last month Real Deal found Midtown Class A market price of $75.78 per square foot. Why was the city paying so far above market rate and how did the city end up, what did you end up paying per square foot on that HRA site? I don't have that number, but I will, what I will say is that the, that article did not report complete information. Um, the, it's a very, it gets a little, you know, I don't want to get too inside baseball here, but uh, there are a lot of factors relating to this deal which we, can, which we would be happy to walk you through, um, but that particular article uh, focused on dollar per square foot based on uh, one type of method to measure space uh, versus another one that both uh, our industry recognized. So they were, they were not comparing apples to apples in that scenario. We, like, I, like I mentioned, we'd be happy to walk you are, through. Are there any additional time. properties in review beyond the ones listed in the New York Post Absolute. article? Oh, property meaning so Are there all similar the leases? Lease all, new? Every new request mm -hmm. for additional space is being reviewed. Will you provide us with that list? Sure. Great. Uh, I'd like to ask Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, followed by uh, Councilmember Cornegy, and we've been joined by Councilmember uh, Joe Borelli. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, good to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you. Um, a couple of quick contracts questions. Um, actually, uh, first about prevailing wage. There's an increase in the budget this year for prevailing wages. Do you know what that reference is? So my understanding is that uh, when the controller's office changes the schedule and increases the, the prevailing wage schedule, we would have to um, do the same for, for our, 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 our workers or our contractors. So what are the contracts where we pay prevailing wage? Can, do you, can you drill down a little bit more on those details? So I know. Are these, yeah. Fire safety is okay. So we have a number of uh, services, contracts. Fire safety is one of them. I know uh, security, gu security guards as well. Those are all, I think it's 2.30 uh, schedule, um, all of which require the payment of prevailing wage. Okay. Um, actually, if you could send over a little more, a few more details on that, I'd appreciate it. The different types of contracts is what I'm interested in, um, where you, you know, give the prevailing wage increases. Um, that would be helpful. And then for the maintaining the court buildings, is that something that you contract out for as well, the cleaning service? No, no. those are full DCAS employees. Okay. And um, 
what's the total cost for maintaining the courts? We have that. 45 million. 45 million? 45 million? And what portion of that gets reimbursed from the state? Okay. 100 Yeah, 100 for cleaners. For cleaners, 100%. For, okay, so it's 45 million total. Mm -hmm. And uh, are they all cleaners? So 100%, that 45 million you get reimbursed from the state? There's a, uh, hi. There's a breakdown. It depends on the category of expense. So, yes, as the commissioner said, we get reimbursed 100% of all the cleaners allocated to court space. Uh, we also get 100% reimbursement on cleaning the supplies uh, for the court facilities. There's a 25% reimbursement for all HVAC and trades titles. Um, we also do the reimbursement on behalf of the DSNY for trash, co trash collections. What percentage on DSNY? The, the trash collections. 100% or 25? 100%. And um, we also get uh, reimbursement uh, for, for capital expenditures, 27% on the interest only. Um, and this is just not particular to the city of New York. This is a statewide um, formula. So all uh, municipalities throughout the state have the same reimbursement. Ah, so yeah. we're not the only ones no, absolutely who not. It's governed by have to pay for a portion. Correct, right. no. And given that the city oh, and just excuse me and appellate courts we get reimbursed a hundred percent of all costs at appellate courts okay what's our shortfall in reimbursement of the total 45 million what is it that the state doesn't cover that that the city funds city funds are used um, we'll have to get back to you on that exact number yeah two million mm. we should get back to you yeah, with the exact number we don't want to guess it. yeah Mm -hmm. Do we have any control over the courts, given that we put some city funds into it? What do you mean when you say control? I don't know. Information that we get. I, w I wonder why there's a carve-out for HVAC. I believe that those that framework is uh, state law, right? Right, correct. It, right. But I'm just wondering why. Yeah, no inherited it inherited it and uh, we were responsible through the court law through the law to provide uh, facilities for court usage throughout the five boroughs it's a are mandate they, that we have no choice are they prompt payers absolutely so within the same year you're showing the expense and the revenue correct Sometimes I mean, it, it, it's dependent on us to submit the claim. Yeah. We do it on a quarterly basis. But once the, the claim is submitted, obviously they have their due diligence on the review of the claim. But soon thereafter, the reimbursement occurs. So are you up to date? Do you invoice? Do you have a, is it scheduled to invoice every quarter? Every, every quarter, correct. Um, it, it depends on what is going on within the office in terms of availability. Um, we could get back to you as to what was the last claim that was submitted yeah. to the courts. And, um, you know, yes, we could do that. Yeah, I'd mm -hmm. be interested in knowing the timing. Mm -hmm. 46 million is a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Um, so I chair the Committee on Small Business, and I'm, I'm a little concerned. I uh, am inundated with small businesses who are registering complaints about escalating uh, uh, rents and leases, fees in the city of New York. And I understand that part of DCAS's portfolio contains commercial spaces available. Is there any reason that we couldn't look at the uh, renewal of those leases at under market rates as we are the city, and, and we're finding mom and pops being forced out at a regular basis because of free market uh, rents, commercial free market rents. Sure, that is something that uh, we started to look at more closely. A lot of our leases for retail space are long-term leases that we've inherited uh, many years ago. Um, but yes, that's something that we are we we've we've starting to take a look at. So I would really be uh, grateful if my office could 
uh, be, in, be in on that because we're, we're really trying to make sure that we keep the fabric of the city of New York uh, what it's been, which has been, you know, based on uh, the, the culture of mom and pop businesses operating in every single borough, in every single community, and they're finding it incredibly dif difficult to do that. And as a city, you know, I'd like to think that we could be creative, especially in properties that we have purview over. So I'd really like to work with you on sure. looking at a, a, a formula that works. Absolutely. For, for We do actually, you know, have leases with smaller businesses, and, and we do uh, have good relationships with them and and the and we consider um their their size when we set the rates right so but are you know for the for the bulk of your uh, lease agreements they're still at market rate correct depending on when they were set okay so if we could if we could just uh, we follow up I, I greatly appreciate it sure thank you uh, and uh just to follow up on uh, our small business chair's request, uh, in other cities, other states, other countries I've been to, they've had uh, startup competitions for folks who wanted to go from being street vendor to having a, a small uh, brick and mortar or from the, the home kitchen and bike sale type situation. And uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm, as you know, I've done tech entrepreneur stuff, uh, but when it comes to the challenges of the brick and mortar small business, having the type of space where people can engage in short-term businesses where they have a six-month, one-year, two-year lease to get their feet on the ground, raise capital, raise money without having to lose everything if they don't actually succeed, but having that pre-built space is incredibly, is that something you'd be interested in? I'd love to explore what that looks like um, and, and see if it would fit into our portfolio. Okay. So going to go into uh, what I had planned for uh, round two. Uh, I'd like to invite my favorite Deputy Commissioner, Don Finnach. And uh, our, uh, my, uh, the Chair for Civil Service and Labor, Danique Miller, could not be here, but uh, this is something that he and I have been focused on since our election in 2014, since our election and since uh, becoming in 2014. We've held two hearings on this, and according to the Provisional Reduction Plan, Released in October 2014, we had 22,939 provisional employees. The goal in that plan was to reduce that number by 8,666 by the end of 2016. And uh, as uh, a science fiction author, Douglas Adams, once said, I love the sound, the, the whooshing sound deadlines make as they uh, fly by. Uh, and so despite early progress, this didn't happen, and as your quarterly report of March 31st, 2017 indicates, we are now at 23,066 provisionals, which is 127 more than when you started, uh, which means the problem's actually gotten worse. So I guess one just big value question is, does this administration prefer civil servants and the commensurate rights with coming, that come with being a civil servant and the uh, exam where people have to know specific information to get in the job, which comes with long-term planning for future needs, uh, or is there a preference for provisionals that are at will, that do not need to have the same skills or knowledge as their peers, uh, that can be hired based on short-term planning and short-term needs? So the, I would I would reframe uh, that setup, <laughs> uh, how you set it up. So the a couple of things. When we first started with the provisional plan, um, we were at 22. The the the, the, the factor that you that you raised 22,000 or so. Um, not anticipated in that plan were the fact that there were going to be hires in the titles for which we were not equipped or resourced to provide exams for. So, you know, I think that there's always, uh, th uh, this issue is a little complicated to, to talk through because there are so many moving pieces. So I think this administration has shown actually a lot of commitment to the civil service system. In fact, we were funded to enhance, given more resources to increase the number of civil service exams um, in order to create lists to be able to appoint uh, permanent appointments to, to some of the titles. 
Um, so we, this, this administration very much is committed to helping us drive down those numbers. In addition to the, the hiring and the titles that were not anticipated, uh, before is that government has grown, right? Um, we've been hiring uh, more, and again, when we set uh, up the target uh, in the initial plan, uh, that was not factored in. Because if you actually look at all of the provisionals, and we call that ad how where we addressed provisionals, where we issued lists um, and, um, and, and permanent appointments were made, we actually addressed over 10,000 uh, provisional employees during the course of the plan. Unfortunately, hiring increased in titles that DCAS did not have the resources to administer exams for. What I'm happy to announce is that as of April 30th, uh, the number of provisionals has decreased uh, uh, to 22,666. And if you look at the end of November of 2016, where unfortunately there was a, an increase uh, of and we were at 23,894. So in a few months, you are seeing a downward trend in this. Uh, we anticipate that going forward with the uh, continued administration of the qualified incumbent exams and all of the other conventional uh, exams that we're going to administer both in this, the rest of this fiscal year and the upcoming fiscal year, uh, we expect to see those numbers uh, go down. We're investing just a, a, a note, and I think I've talked uh, about this issue in the previous, uh, in my, in the preliminary testimony. Uh, we also were funded to upgrade our IT systems um, in order to uh, make civil service much more user friendly to New Yorkers uh, uh, in order to not only develop and administer exams more quickly for, for us, but to improve the customer service experience uh, for New York City residents to take and, and avail themselves of city uh, employment opportunities. So all of that put together, and I, I'll turn to Dawn to, for, to have her fill anything that I missed, um, demonstrates uh, a significant commitment by this administration uh, to, to help us um, administer the city civil service system. Dawn, did I miss anything? No, you didn't miss anything. Um, good afternoon. Um, the only thing that I would add. Uh, we're just going to swear you in. He doesn't believe you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. I do. The only thing that I would add is just um, a clarification. I know um, when you asked about this administration's commitment and you mentioned that um, someone who obtains permanent status, the fact that through an examination, we can clarify that they, are clar that they are qualified to perform that work. We actually conduct the same review for anyone who serves provisionally. Um, there is a process by which we review the qualifications, ensuring that people are in the appropriate titles and that they have the education and experience. So whether they're provisional or actually take an exam, their qualifications are vetted. So the provisionals take an exam? Well, provisionals serving in a competitive exam, either they're slated to take an exam um, when it's on our schedule, or, I mean, they're just pretty much awaiting to take an examination. Our provisionals serve in competitive titles. And so I was just um, I, speaking I, I, to I, I, I value that you're, you're doing preliminary vetting, uh, but and not to upset every single person in grade school and high school and college because none of us ever wanted to take exams. But, but it turns out that uh, unless we have a better way of doing things, exams test knowledge. That's why we have them. So uh, I, I just respectfully disagree and feel that the civil service exam at least allows us to, through that exam, test the knowledge and ensures it. And I, I believe it is perhaps better because uh, I think all of us have at some point either uh, interviewed or, or, or in, been interviewed uh, where folks may sometimes exaggerate uh, some of their skills or experiences. And uh, so... I agree. Uh, I just it, wanted to point out that clarification to ensure that I, you knew that so, qualifications were in fact vetted. And, and so that, that being said, so a lot of time has, has passed since October 2014. And according to your report that I looked at before the preliminary budget, uh, 13... 1,278 of the provisionals aren't ones that you inherited from a previous administration. Those are folks you brought in. And that's more than, uh, oh, in 2014, we, didn't, we weren't able to predict. That, that's ongoing. So is there a commitment from this administration to cease 
hiring provisionals. And now that you've been in this, you, you've been here for more than a year, uh, Dawn's been doing this for a while, that you can accurately predict needs and you can plan for the future and start issuing the civil service exams and stop hiring provisionals and, and build out a strong, healthy civil service. So we're in fact doing just that. We are building and improving on systems that had long been um, uh, not improved um, and, and, and led to, has led to a very long lead time and cycle time in administering and developing exams and lists, which cause uh, the need to hire provisionals. So I just want to take one second. If we, if we determine that we will no longer hire provisionals um, and DCAS has not been able to administer a test for a particular title, the net result is that agencies won't be able to hire people to do the things that serve New Yorkers. So I think what we're, str what we're striving to balance is the operational needs of agencies to fulfill their mission uh, while like, like, like I've been talking about, developing a much more robust civil service IT platform um, in order to uh, administer an increased number of exams. Um, what we don't want is to have such a rigid approach to civil service management that will prevent agencies from bringing on people in order to, for example, um, uh, roll out UPK, right? So we have to balance those needs uh, at the same time, essentially building the plane while flying it. Um, and, and that's where you see some of the increased in increased hires. There are in titles, there are in titles for which DCAS has not been able to administer an exam and create a list for agencies to hire off of. The answer can't be that the agencies should be prevented from hiring. So building a plane while fly flying? Is a, is a very bad idea. There's a reason why we don't do that. It's why we don't drive vehicles across a bridge while we're building it. It's why we have pontoon bridges and we have other tools. So uh, j just for those watching, because we're, we're way into the weeds here, uh, with a civil service exam, it's not like we have a job opening and then we administer it. We administer a civil service exam and then people wait years for openings. Is that correct? For certain titles, depending on the, on the need for the agencies to hire and the amount of people that sign up for and take the exam and how many people appear on a list, it may take more than one year, two years to get through the entire list to fill those vacancies. So, so, there's these, so you as DCAS can start uh, administering exams for places that you can predict and where you can predict the need, and uh, so happens as a city, we can start going from planning a year ahead of time to, sorry, to planning for tomorrow to planning a year ahead of time, and if we do that, you can actually do the exams, ask people to sign up, and have a list waiting for those new hiring needs. And that's what we're doing now. We have 800 so, so competitive titles mm -hmm. that we would, in, in best case scenario, where we were fully funded in order to do just that, we would have to essentially administer 800 tests a year. We are not, we have not been able to do that type of volume. Um, with every How year, much money do you need to do that? We, I don't have that calculation. With every year that we have uh, uh, started, I guess since 2014, uh, we have added, the, we have increased the number of exams we've given per every fiscal year. And in the last fiscal year, correct me if I'm wrong, Don, it was the highest number of uh, exams that DCAS had ever administered, I so, believe. So I, I yes. guess you've done some great work in terms of computer testing and automated testing, much like in the private sector. You don't have to wait to sit for the, the GMAT or the GRE. You just show up at a testing center, take it when you feel like it, and that's becoming more and more the standard. Similarly, in construction, you just go take your OSHA. Uh, so uh, can, can I get a commitment that you're not hiring another 13,000 people or, or as provisionals or that you, what's your goal and how much money do you need so you can do things the right way as, as both of us agree so that you have the 800 exams ready that you can have the list ready and that we don't have to go through the provisional route. What I can commit is what we've been doing. We will deliver a 
automated IT system that will help us administer more exams in a quicker fashion to be able to turn out civil service lists as much as quickly as possible to provide those uh, that pool of candidates to agencies. I can't quantify how many uh, how many uh, titles that we were going to have to deliver that. We don't have the system yet. We're currently building that out. It's we, we, as, as an oversight body, it's hard to do oversight and hold anyone accountable if they're not setting concrete goals. Uh, more is great, but your agency has failed at more. Uh, your, your agency is in worse shape now than when it started. So we, in, it would be helpful to have, uh, and, and I think we will demand, and you will get a letter from us demanding so from myself and the Finance Committee, specific metrics for how many of the exams are currently can be automated and computerized, how many can you get computerized and automated, and what remains, and then specific understanding of why. Is that information you're comfortable sharing? What we can do is we can share with you our FY17 and 18 exam schedule uh, that will lay out what we're doing. Um, what I would like to say is I would like to disagree with your characterization that we're failing, as I mentioned, um, our provisional numbers are going down, um, especially since the new plan has come into place where we've been working on multiple paths uh, to make sure that we're, that we're getting some success. It's hard. We want to make sure that we're balancing agency needs to hire and fulfill their missions while making sure that we're optimizing all of the resources that we have in order to uh, administer as many exams as possible. And we're a work in progress. We, we will admit that, but we're working hard. Your progress is a drop of 300 provisionals over three years, and at that rate, uh, it, it would take something like 220 years to reduce the provisionals. Well, so, I, according this to my numbers, administration will not last that long. So, according uh, to my numbers, we dropped more than a thousand in four months, and that's progress. So, it, so, so in 2014, we had. Do you agree that we had 22,939 provisionals? I don't have that number in front of me. I, I'm Dawn? sure we did. Yes. Okay. So I, I get that you're, you, you've been able to use the exams to try to convert people from provisionals into civil servants, but at the same time, if you're doing such rampant hiring and bringing on 13,000 people, no matter how good the work you're doing is on the back end of converting folks, uh, it's not helping. And, and the other piece is just, it, it's, the provisional intake is different than the civil service intake, and it, it's, I feel like it's, it's not quite fair to those who are taking the civil service exams to have to compete for fewer seats because provisionals got in and were able to take the qualified incumbent exam without having to compete. So just to clarify, no provisionals can just come in and take a qualified incumbent exam. They would have to be serving in that title for two years. And that, that concession and that law that was passed was supported by all of our partners in labor uh, because they recognize that if uh, uh, someone has been hired to do the job and has been doing it successfully for a long time, that they, they, they have proven with their ability to do the job that they can do the job. And if I can just underscore um, the comments regarding our failure. I think it really depends on what lens you view failure because in 2014 it was a very different time. The level of investment in automation, that was something that did not exist for us. The investment in additional staff, that did not exist for us. Um, and so provisional reduction, it is extremely important. We understand what our obligations are, but there are other aspects of civil service for the city of New York that needed to be addressed, and we're currently doing that. Over the next two fiscal years, we will be administering exams for 333 titles. That is unprecedented presented for DCAS, and that will afford us the opportunity to provide permanent status to those folks who've been waiting. The implementation of the qualified incumbent exam, that allows us to address 4,000 to 5,000, um, to provide status to four to 5,000 individuals who've been waiting because we've not had the capacity. So I think to compare 2014 to where we are now, I think that not unpeeling the onion a little bit does us a disservice. So I just wanted to clarify some of those points. Look forward to working with you. I'm going to move on to uh, your capital budget. I'd like to, uh, this is something that I was talking with a council member uh, 
Traeger about. He's chair of uh, the uh, Resiliency Committee. Uh, so a project uh, jointly funded by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, and the city, $252 million from the city, $260 million in funding uh, uh, from, in federal funding. Uh, and so there's a $512 million uh, capital line in DCAS. Uh, and it's designed to integrate flood protection into the neighborhood and to uh, keep people protected. And this runs from uh, Montgomery Street all the way up to East 25th Street. Uh, and so the construction was originally slated to begin next month. Uh, so the, the first thing I have to ask, uh, just because of the world we now live in is so, uh, and, and so I guess, Commissioner, in, in spite of current federal policy, do you believe in climate change and coastal flooding associated with it is real? I believe in climate, climate change is, is real. Okay, okay. The, the President of the United States agree, disagrees with you, but I, I do agree with you. Uh, so uh, in terms of this program, so the money was originally supposed to go on, sorry, the project was actually supposed to start in June. It now looks like funding has been uh, sent out to 2019 and 2020, and that's not even when the work will begin, that's just when the funding has now been allocated to, uh, is there a risk given the HUD cuts to this $260 million? And is what is the risk of having another superstorm between now and then? So with that particular project, that's actually not a decast managed project. Uh, it appears in our budget, but it's not one that we own. Um, I believe you have additional information. Uh, yeah. That project is managed by the Office of Resiliency and Recovery, um, but they they have told me that the project is um, on schedule to begin construction in early 2019 um, and to complete construction, I believe, in 2024. Um, what the chances are of another superstorm standing between now and then is not known. As a commissioner, do you feel that, so, I, so I, I, it's, the issue is just that it's, it's in your capital budget, and if it's in your capital budget, my belief is you should be managing it or you should be working with the Office of Management Budget to move it to the appropriate agency, but do, do you feel that waiting until 2025 for a project that was supposed to start now is feasible given what we're seeing in Florida and all over the country in terms of flooding, and do we have this, this almost 10 years to, to wait? The project originally shows as DCAS managed, but when the project is assigned eventually either to DDC or any other entity who's going to oversee the construction, the managing agency and the budget is changed from DCAS to that entity. But in its initial funding, it shows up as DCAS and managing agency in, in, in its beginning origins. But again, there's other items in our capital budget, including uh, council adoption add-ons that are put into DCAS's budget that we don't manage. It's just a, a placeholder, and it shows up in the 856 capital budget. And that's typically for offices or agencies that don't themselves have a capital budget to, 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 to put it in. Do you think it's a good practice to put money that's supposed to be managed by a different agency and another agency uh, as a placeholder? I, I can't comment on that. It's not our practice. Do you, do you feel that as a commissioner, if there's money with that's being with, with the DCAS name on it, that you have a duty to make sure that that project moves forward properly, even if it means leaning on a, another agency or working with the first deputy mayor to say, hey, this project appears to have gotten stalled almost 10 years? We, we are in communication with OMB. We know what those projects are and how they are identified. Um, this is not the only example. I think you mentioned council. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's about you know. at, Right. Mm -hmm. So there are other examples um, of, of that happening. And as you know, we, we, we speak with OMB. We're clear about who owns what, um, and we're comfortable with that. Do you agree we should get this done sooner than 2025? I, I have no insight into the particulars. I, I mean, I can't comment either way. I, I, I would 
like to just add that <clears throat> this project is not the only safeguard um, from the type of damage that occurred during Superstorm Sandy. There, there have been other measures that have been put in place. Con Ed has spent over a billion dollars in hardening, hardening their infrastructure. Um, so th there are other measures that have been taken already to help mitigate any future uh, storm event, uh, damages from storm events. Can we save this $500 million and put it somewhere else because of those other measure measures? No, I, th I think you want multiple layers of defense um, in order to uh, mitigate to the most practical extent possible damage from, from future storms related to climate change. So will you go back to, to OMB and, and the first deputy mayor and, and just say this is money that's in our budget and we want this spent as soon as possible because we are concerned about climate change and coastal flooding and uh, 2025 is too long to wait? I have confidence in, in the team that is running this project. I know uh, the complexities of constructing the, the project. One example is that there are um, high tension transmission lines underground where this project needs to be built. That takes time to build around and integrate into. You can't simply shut those off um, without uh, taking down power to uh, millions of people. So th it's a very complex project. Um, as I said, there are other measures that have been put in place in the interim, uh, and, and I believe that with the complexity of the project, it is moving um, on a reasonable schedule. Please, please just take it back to them because I, I I know that if I don't do this advocacy and even one person gets hurt or has property damage because we didn't get this done starting in June and I didn't fight as hard as I could, I would not be able to sleep tonight. So uh, another item that we noticed in your budget is uh, the city's been putting temporary lighting at uh, New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA, uh, and so there's $4 million that's in the executive budget for temporary lighting towers. And uh, to, I, I'm curious whether or not it's working, and if it is working, uh, why we're renting them versus just buying them and attaching them permanently to protect our residents and public housing. We're uh, we're still in discussions to get a better idea of what the what the actual next steps are. Um, so at this point, we're, we're, we're still in preliminary discussions of what that looks like uh, with NYCHA. Do you know what we're getting for this $4 million and, and how much we're paying per? No, not yet. We don't know the details. Okay. Uh, how soon can you get us answers on the temporary lighting towers? It's up to, it, it's uh, driven by NYCHA. NYCHA is, and with the conjunction of the uh, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, they're determining um, where the light towers are going, how many they want to purchase, etc. Uh, the money was put into our budget by OMB as a mechanism to purchase or to rent the, the light towers because we do have the contracts, the citywide contracts. So in order for NYCHA to be able to tap into those contracts, the money was placed into our budget on their behalf. But they are the ones who are driving the scope and the, the uh, a, a number of towers they want to purchase, et cetera. We are waiting from them instructions as to what type of procurements they want to do going forward. Does, so DCAS provides a lot of technical support to agencies like Board of Standards and Appeals and agencies with whom you're dealing with leases and whatnot, and you're hoping to generate substantial cost savings. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is again very similar to what we just talked about in terms of resiliency. Is there a role for DCAS and a strong DCAS commissioner who has worked in the mayor's office of contract services and has a broader understanding to move from a more ministerial role of somebody put the money in the budget, no. somebody else will take it out to saying, hey, why are we, as long as this money is moving from our budget, we have jurisdiction. If we have jurisdiction, we have to be responsible and make sure that 
the city is saving every single dollar. Absolutely, and we've availed ourselves, and I know that there's been preliminary discussions both uh, with NYSHA, with the Office of Citywide Procurement, and with the uh, Citywide Fleet Operations. So they have had discussions with us as to um, the type of equipment that's out there, et cetera, and what may be most beneficial in terms of efficiency um, and in terms of um, you know, gas emissions, et cetera. So they have had those discussions and we're awaiting for them to come back to us. So we're not playing like a, uh, an outside role. They have engaged us. Okay, thank you. And when the other agencies are asking why you're all of a sudden a little bit out of your lane, uh, you can let them know it's because you don't want to have to deal with a uh, rough budget hearing. I'd like to ask a couple of questions about fleet. Sure. Uh, so we have a, a fleet of several thousand vehicles in the city. When we're done with those vehicles, uh, we sell them. Uh, what is the average and what is the maximum age of vehicles in the city fleet? The average age of the vehicles we sell, and by the way, Keith Kerman, the chief fleet officer for the city. Um, Hold on, let's minister the oath, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. So just want to start with the big picture of all the vehicles and uh, their average age and the maximum age. What's the oldest vehicle we have in our fleet? Uh, well, we have, I, I believe 1953, but that is a parade car um, that is used for special and ceremonial events. So, but it's still an active vehicle in the city fleet. Um, the average age is about seven years, um, but keep in mind that you know across the whole fleet. But we have an incredibly diverse fleet. There are 160 types of vehicles that we're operating. You have a much more aggressive replacement plan for patrol cars for the police department, and you don't need as aggressive a a replacement plan where you're talking about like a, a a van that might be used for trades work and is really like a mobile office but may only go 10 miles a day. Um, so so it's a very diverse fleet. It's it's really it's sometimes 160 separate businesses that you're running on, on behalf of the city. Um, but the average age is about seven years. And what is the average time between purchase and retirement of a city vehicle? About seven years. Yes. Okay. And what's the minimum time before you would consider uh, retiring a vehicle and selling it? All right, so the core standard for the majority of non-policing vehicles is nine years, 80,000 miles for sedans and SUVs, 10 years, 80,000 miles for pickups and vans. And that's a huge percentage of our fleet. It's three to five years for police cars. So. Um, and, but, but going to when we actually auctioned, because we looked into this, because we, we knew you were, were interested in it, um, on average, excluding police cars, which are a kind of a little bit of a different thing, um, we auction at 13 years. So in truth, we're actually getting more years on average than the core standard, but a little less on miles. So it's actually, on average, 76,000 miles um, in 13 years. So the miles tends to be a little less than that 80,000 standard on average, um, but the year is more. So if a vehicle hasn't gone that full 80,000 and we can still get a few years of life, that's what we're doing. And so what are you using to determine what needs to be retired? Is it emissions? Is it mileage? Is it age, breakdowns, maintenance costs? So, you know, the in the fleet manual, we actually outline all the specific requirements and, and how it works is agencies propose salvage lists. Um, there's a very specific form called the 414 form that agencies use. We then review those with, with each agency. You know, the basic indicators are always age and miles or age and engine wear because some equipment, you're really not looking at odometers, you're looking at engine hours. But then you have to go case by case and look at a vehicle. So if a vehicle is in a major collision, you may auction that and sell it years early. Um, if a vehicle is a very high profile, highly important vehicle, so say ambulances, right? We've been working to get to five to six years of replacement on ambulances, and we are very focused on investing there. Rack trucks, dump trucks, other types of equipment, you know, if, if we bring those over to 12 to 15 years, will do just fine. So it's case by case. We sign off on every auction. 
in every specific vehicle. Um, we start with miles and age, but then you do get into mechanical wear, you get into, you can get into emissions issues, um, and we list these out with the agencies, and, and it is case by case. You know, you don't want to make a, it, your cars can, can Is the manual public, or can we have a copy to share with the public? Sure, the fleet manual is, is posted online at the DCAS website. Great, I will go read it, uh, and sadly you all know that's true. <laughs> go for it. Uh, and so, uh, I sadly watch Adam ruins everything where he ruins different things in my life. It's a YouTube channel. Are there any situations where because we need to meet certain goals for electric vehicles, we are replacing uh, a, a vehicle that uh, uses a fossil fuel with an electric vehicle uh, before its natural replacement cycle? So in the electric vehicle program that we have been um, implementing and where we, have, we are really making progress, we did not want to do what we, and we did discuss the question of whether to do escalated replacement. And we are not doing escalated replacement. Um, what we are doing, though, which kind of achieves a little bit that, is some right sizing. So wherever we can find SUVs that might be older, where we can replace them with sedans, we're doing that. And sometimes we're escalating the replacement because we have an older SUV, maybe not as old as a sedan, but we're replacing those. Um, and other kinds of downsizing. Um, we're not doing escalated replacement, but um, you know, the city, you know, we are very focused on what are the older, ve the older vehicles out there. We're very close um, to getting rid of every pure gas sedan in SUV in the city. Um, you know, I, I don't have the exact number, but we're, back, we're down to the hundreds of non-alternative fuel vehicles that we are operating outside the police department where th there are different issues. So we, we are pushing hard and, and ahead of schedule to, to replace out, um, but we're not taking a, a three-year-old hybrid Prius and saying, well, let's just get rid of it so we can get a plug-in car. Therein is my nightmare. So I guess along those lines and just in order to do our due diligence, would DCAS consider providing a voluntary public list to the council and perhaps even on the open data set with your vehicles make, model, purchase date, purchase price, and then retirement date, retirement price? Um, yeah, we could look at that. I mean, certainly the auction list, the list of vehicles that we are putting for auction, because of course those go to public sale, are posted every week online at the DCAS website. Um, but if you were looking at some kind of like broader historical record of vehicles from, from birth to salvage, you know, we can look at what, the, what that might look like. Uh, and so along those lines, where, where, can, I, where can I buy a, a retired city vehicle that's 13 years old with 70-something <laughs> thousand miles? Well, you can't because city employees are barred from procuring city auction vehicles um, by longstanding DCAS and COIB rule. So and my wife? Um, take your chances. Um, so... Um, I, 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 I won't do any favors for you there. So my, my constituents um, can, though. Uh, your constituents, as long as they do, do not work for the city of New York? Yes, all right. So you go to, we went, to, um, we used to occupy six acres decasted at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and about five or six years ago, working with the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, because there are a lot more exciting ways to use six acres of prime real estate than used car salvage, um, we went to online auction with propertyroom.com. So if you go to propertyroom.com, you can, um, and you are not a city employee, and you will have to check a box um, that says you are not a city employee before you. It's free for everyone from the general public. You do not have to pay a fee. You have to give a credit card like anything else. Um, but, and then you can procure, and there, and there are public auctions as we are required to do. So um, it, it's fairly easy to access. DCAS also publishes the list each week online of what will be auctioned. In so, the city record? Um, yes, something? auction is included in the city record. I, I, but I not the was, items. You know, I would have to check. I know we okay. worked a notification piece. I, that was a while ago. I have to Let's check. Let's just how make that sure works. that it's in an open data set. And so along the same lines, thank you for providing the list and the breakdown of where the electric vehicles are in the various agencies. Uh, if you could give us a little bit more explanation, because what we found was there are off-road solar vehicles. So I wanted to know what it was and where I can buy one. Um, okay, so we, so the city fleet has two sets of plug-in equipment pieces when you talk about the fleet. Not, all right, so there's on-road equipment, 
um, in on-road vehicles. That's basically the Prius Prime, the Chevy Bolt, the Chevy Volt, the Ford Fusion Energy. Those are, you know, electric cars. We also have some electric vans and things like that. The city actually also operates, I, I want to say it's about 600 solar or electric off-road pieces. So what are examples? Gem electric carts. If you go to the parks department, there are about 200 electric carts. Those are bubble little carts. You, you should see them everywhere if you hang out in parks. Those are all electric carts meant for safe operation within parks. Those are generally not licensed, generally not used on the road. For, we use electric forklifts wherever we can to get away from propane forklifts. Those solar light Boards that DOT puts all over the place to notify for traffic movements. Um, we have begun to invest in solar light towers. Um, and we are, by the way, talking to NYCHA, and that's one of the things we're talking to NYCHA about, is whether we could implement whatever that technology they want as a solar or solar hybrid. So electric forklifts, gem electric carts, um, light boards, solar light towers, and a lot of other off-road equipment. You know, the city fleet when we say the city fleet is X number, you know, 30,000 vehicles, 5,000 of those are really off-road equipment pieces from chippers to forklifts to trailers. They're not cars. So I'm, I'm not actually a car person, but uh, I'm glad to have learned a lot about this and hope for anyone uh, who's uh, watching at line, online uh, or at home on TV, and I imagine there will be a lot of folks visiting propertyroom.com and uh, hopefully it will earn us some money. Uh, we're going to follow up with uh, questions. Uh, thank you. Sure. And uh, looking forward to continuing our work together on provisionals, on fleet, on so very many different things because your agency is just so large and every day you learn new things like your involvement in resiliency. So uh, thank you. We're going to